just want to say hello and thank you so much for everybody who um, signed up and is attending today. Um, welcome to the first of our speaker series of being in relationship. Uh, my name is Crystal Cheatham and um, I'm actually the creator of our Bible app, which is a, a co-sponsor with Auburn. And um, I am also the host of a podcast called Lord of Mercy. And uh, the whole point of that podcast is to talk about God, sex, and the Bible. And um, I do that because uh, when I came out as a lesbian, um, I could not step away from my faith and uh, relied on conversations like the one I have in the podcast and the one we're having today um, to reconcile my faith with my orientation. So I just still wanna thank you all so much for being here and um, opening up yourselves to, uh, to this kind of work um, in order to love harder and further than, than uh, maybe we have before. Um, I also wanna thank Auburn Seminary for being such a fantastic partner uh, in this. Um, every single one of the staff members that I've worked with has just been so gracious and kind. And uh, I need to give a sh huge shout out to Sharon Groves, who likes to retreat into the background after uh, creating masterpieces like this one, but um, she's just been an impeccable partner and um, has uh, such a capacity uh, to, to will the world around her uh, to create change. So thank you so much, Sharon. Um, and what can I say about this program, Being in a Relationship? Um, this is a speaker series. This speaker series is part of uh, a larger series and is where I first encountered both Cedric Harmon and Melvin Bray. We spent a weekend uh, together with other individuals, much like yourselves, um, in tight quarters in Florida earlier this year, discussing some of the topics that um, they'll bring to you today. Um, around uh, gender and sexuality and faith. And uh, at the time, uh, race was a huge part of it, which is uh, something we're not gonna be bringing today, but um, is one of those heavy things. And um, I can say that I walked away feeling so hopeful that uh, this schism, this, this thing between LGBTQ people and faith, religion, and the church is something completely man-made and, um, and can be lifted, can be worked on, can um, uh, become a better and safer place for all of us. Uh, we have to be, we have to be in relationship at this moment more than we have in the past year, uh, two years, uh, mostly because we are living through, uh, as the news likes to say, unprecedented times, impeccable times, um, but what I'm getting at is, uh, is the close quarters that we're all in during COVID. Um, and uh, right now, we have um, audience, an audience of, of uh, two very different uh, kind of people here with us today. Um, we have more than, we have folks who have uh, a heart for LGBTQ, uh, a heart for the LGBTQ people in their lives, um, but are trying to figure out how to, to love them from um, as, cons as, uh, as being conservative and, and hopeful. And then we have those who are strong allies who are trying to be compassionate, but are struggling with the faith part. And so um, we invite you both into this space today and we believe that there is room for all of us here. Um, and if it feels like this conversation is, is provocative, uh, it's intended to be this way. Um, you don't have to agree with everything. That's not a requirement, but it can induce in you a feeling of discomfort. Um, it happened for me. And uh, at the time, I was very thrilled that I had both um, Cedric and Melvin there to kind of guide me through those, those feelings and emotions. Um, but I'd like to think that leaning into the, into the discomfort is where we find our growth. Um, also, um, as we try and get uh, our, our second speaker on, Melvin, Melvin Bray, I just want you to know that this is an experiment. Um, we're not going to get it fully right, and I just ask that you would hang in there with us as uh, we figure it, all out, uh, figure it all out with you. And uh, so right off the bat, I want to introduce our two speakers. We have Cedric Harmon, who is a speaker, a writer, uh, is standing for human rights based on profound faith 
and is the executive director of Many Voices, which is a black church movement for gay and transgender justice. Cedric works directly with black religious leaders and other people of faith to engage in diverse topics at the intersections of religion, faith, and human sexuality. And of course, I wanna introduce Melvin. Melvin Bray is a principal consultant for Labyrinth. He is incredibly skillful at helping communities get where they are trying to go. Melvin brings to bear a unique curator, connector, and collaborator skill set that is indispensable in almost any innovative endeavor. As one collaborative partner put it, when Melvin's around, good things happen. And I have to say that I believe that with all of my heart. Um, I'm really excited about the talk that they're going to deliver today. And I'm just going to take a moment to, uh, to uh, uh, figure out where we're at with, uh, with the tech. Um, Cedric, could you help me figure out if, if we're ready for Melvin to come on? Oh, wait, you're, there you go. Cool. There you okay. go. Okay, here I am. So, let's see. I don't see him yet. Yeah. Maybe. Melvin, are you there? I am here. You. Okay. We just I, won't be able to see you. I can't be seen, but <laughs> <laughs> I am here. Okay. I feel like we just need to give up on that at, at this point, but it's good to hear your voice. Yes, indeed. All right. Hello, Melvin. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing all right. How are you today? Can't complain, can't complain. That I'm glad to be here with everyone. I can't see everyone, but I'm assuming there is an everyone and that there those is, everyone's are here. There is, there is an everyone. I, I'm, I'm, I'm operating in great faith and I'm also seeing some evidence of my faith uh, people <laughs> popping in. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon and for taking and making time uh, to be here. Whatever it took for you to be here and to be uh, participating, we appreciate it greatly. Uh, we know that life uh, shows up in all kinds of ways, uh, including technical difficulties. Uh, and so thank you for joining for this conversation that we're going to share with one another. I'd also like to invite you as you're settling in in front of your screens or wherever you are that you find yourself a comfortable space to be. Check in with your body. Make sure that you're in a comfortable space. Check in with your breathing. Uh, sometimes we come from one event to another event and we haven't paused to just take a good cleansing breath. So I invite you to take a good cleansing breath and settle yourself in and prepare yourself for our time together. <clears throat> so Crystal did provide an introduction that suggested something that I want to reinforce. Uh, you will hear in this conversation likely some things that you've heard before you will hear some things that you've not heard before. You will hear some ideas with which you agree, and you will hear some ideas with which you do not agree. Agreement and acceptance and full contribution to being all right with everything we say, that's not the goal. The goal is to be in the conversation, to feel what you feel, but to remain open to what you're hearing. So if we can commit to being open to hearing what's being said, even in the face of disagreement, then we can actually engage in a relational conversation with one another. Do you agree, Brent? Do you agree, Melvin? Do you think that that's a good way to start? I think that's exactly the way to start. You know, um, I'm sure over the course of time, there's going to be a lot of, of uh, kind of deep theological thought and maybe even some some debate back and forth. But uh, I think unless we take the time to build enough relationship with one another, where we can manage those kinds of uh, pushes and pulls, uh, we, we it, it's hard to get anywhere new together. The other thing that's clear to me is something other than the invitation and the announcement caused you to decide to be here. Something drew you to this conversation. 
there's some reason that you want to be here. And if you can hold on to that motivation, that drive, that curiosity, that interest, that also will enforce and inform our time with one another. Something caused you to want to be here. And in most relationships, something causes you to want to be with the persons that you're with. So I celebrate the fact that you're with and among a group of people who are in some ways similarly motivated, uh, similarly motivated. It may not be the exact same, but something's also driving them to be here. So we can celebrate the fact that we found people who are like us in some way around this topic. They're curious and they're interested. Yeah. So let's get into it. <clears throat> Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and other persons that are of minoritized sexual orientations or marginalized gender identities are human beings here on the planet with and among us in all of their blessed diversity and variety. LGBTQ might suggest to some <clears throat> that all persons that are part of the community are alike. And I just wanna blow that myth right out of the water. There is a vast variety and diversity within the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. Not every- What you mean, Cedric? You <laughs> acting like- <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sitting there laughing for everyone who can't see me. No, I mean, you, the, once you say it, it, it's what jumps out to me is, is the fact that we act like because some group of people got together and put some, some other group of people on the outside that all of a sudden all the attributes that make, make them human somehow disappear. Right. Of course, of course, there, there's all kinds of diversity among, among people of different sexual orientations and gender diversity. Exactly. But sometimes because of the divisions that have been falsely created, people think that that one group is just one group and they're all the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And not, and not unlike all of creation, no one person is exactly alike. Not even twins are exactly alike. They may be twins and they may look alike in many ways, but they are not the same in total. So if we can celebrate and accept and affirm and learn about one another in all of our blessed diversity and variety, we will have an opportunity to expand our understanding of not just one another, but in my view, we have an opportunity to expand our understanding of God and God's self. Indeed, indeed. You know, I, in the years that I've lived, I've come to realize that variety and diversity is a constant, just like change is a constant in our world. What I mean by that is no leaf is the same, no flower is exactly the same. No bird is exactly the same. There's variety. And I believe that that is intentional by the creator's design, that we bring this blessed variety and diversity to enrich and enhance our experience of life on this planet. Well, you know, what's, what's interesting is that's how we've always told the story of creation, right? Right, like, like the story of creation is the story of life breaking forth in all kinds of different ways. And, 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 and the, the Hebrew poets had this way of saying each, uh, uh, of, of describing that diversity by saying each after its kind. And this happened and then each after its kind. And it was this beautiful kind of menagerie of, 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 of coming into existence. But somehow, even though we tell the story that way, when it comes down to how we practice our faith, all of a sudden, it's like we forget that part of the story. That the story is rooted in the creation of so many different things, each after its kind. And that was good. And that was good. And that, that diversity 
or even let's take it out of that term because sometimes the word diversity is loaded for people. Let's say that difference, that difference is not a negative. I like to think of it this way. Difference is not deficiency. Difference right. is abundance. That's right. That's right. So then you've mentioned this already, Melvin, and I thank you for bringing this to, to bear. I think we've, we've been pointing to it. The way in which we come to sacred text, and in this instance, the way in which we come to the Bible, can often either be illuminating or confusing. Mm. Because it depends on the interpretive lens that you bring to the text. So as you were talking about the creation narratives that are in the book of Genesis, you lifted up and it was good. That, that kind of blessed affirmation of the goodness in creation. And, but some might lift up another aspect of that, of that narrative and view that narrative as prescriptive. This is how it was, and this is how it shall always be. As opposed to the story elevating an idea of what the beginning of life on earth, on this planet looked like. Could you talk about viewing the scriptures as a direct directive that should not in any way be altered? Melvin. Cedric, it looks like um, we've dropped Melvin again. Ah. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but okay. we're working on it. Okay. He'll be right back. He's okay. coming in, back in. Okay. Well, um, while he's coming back, uh, yeah, I think that, that sometimes uh, we, we as uh, followers of Jesus, Christians, uh, believers, people of faith, we can read our secret writings in a particular way uh, that causes us to miss the intent of the stories, the intent of the Bible. So Melvin, I think you're back. Are you back? I am, I am. Uh, did you Thank hear you my question? Bear with me, good folk. I did not. Okay. <laughs> what was that question? <laughs> okay. So uh, a repeat for those that heard it. So I was saying that you lifted up the creation narrative and that yes. what you lifted out of that narrative is you lifted up that kind of blessed uh, affirmation at the end uh, of creation's narratives that says, and it was good. And it and was good, that, baby. And I said that you lifted that up, but for some people, they read the sacred text and those Genesis creation narratives as prescriptive, as if they decide and name how it was and how it shall always be. That is not a lifting up of ideas, but it's a direction and that they come to scripture and read scripture in that way. So it's hard and fast and it's prescriptive. So could you talk about that kind of reading and lifting up the kernel of, of, of principle and truth out of scripture as opposed to reading it in a proscriptive, hard and fast rule way of reading scripture? Well, you know, here's, here's the problem with trying to read scripture as prescriptive, right? Immediately from the jump, you have two different creation stories. So if you're trying to read it as prescriptive, the question is, which one's right, right? <laughs> right? Genesis 1 tells this one way in which things come into existence. And by the time you get to Genesis 2, there's a different Hebrew storyteller who's telling the story from a different point of view, uh, towards a, almost towards a, a, a almost as if with a different purpose and a different emphasis, right? Like, so part of, part of the problem is the way scripture itself works, it is not prescriptive as much as it's a conversation, right? And then the, the other part that happens is, you know, a, as a storyteller, one of the things that I, I have had to learn um, it, it, it is that you can't tell everything, right? Like you can only tell parts of the story, right? Like, you, you, but you can't tell everything. So, so, you know, the idea that, you know, it named birds, 
but it didn't name all the different kinds of birds doesn't mean that there aren't all the different kinds of birds. One, one, one animal you'll never see mentioned in the creation uh, uh, myth the way that it comes down to us uh, uh, in, from our Judeo-Christian tradition is platypus. You don't see platypus mentioned. You don't see uh, ostrich mentioned. You don't see a lot of things mentioned, but we know, we see with our eyes, those things exist. And so with that same, with that same kind of way that we understand how story works, then, then we also have to understand that just because in this particular narrative, you have, you have these kinds of archetypal Adam and Eve, and it, as who, who they represent humanity doesn't mean that they represent all the different forms that humanity takes. Excellent. Yes. I think you did. I think that that was really a very clear way to begin to understand what's going on when we come to sacred writings and what lens we bring, but also what were the lenses of the writers and their original intent. That's and right. so all of that is at play when we engage in study and reflection and seeking inspiration from sacred writings. Because we come to the text seeking to gain some insights, uh, and those insights then play into our lived experience. So often something's happening in our life and we turn to scripture for some degree of understanding as we work it out for ourselves right here and now. And so we have to understand that there's that interplay between where we are in time and where those writers were. And if there's some inspiration that we can draw from those ancient writings for the moment that we find ourselves in. That's great. And they would have to be. I mean, like if you think of the way that, 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 that scripture and, and, and faith traditions come down to us, you know, they, they, people have always been in dialogue about the divine and about our purpose and about meaning and, and so on and so forth. And so, so, so the, just like we are in that dialogue and we are in that conversation even now in this moment, so too people were in those conversations. And it wasn't always about who was right and who was wrong, but how do we help one another continue to evolve and continue to grow and find our sense of purpose and our sense of who we can become and the good that we can bring into the world? Yes. So I'm going to take a little bit of a turn, but not much of a turn in our conversation. So since we are in this present moment, <clears throat> dealing with some unexpected and very unsettling realities, we have a virus that theoretically came from uh, a bat and has now shown up in human beings. And this virus has not been seen in human beings before. And that has caused us to live uh, for the last couple of months in ways that we had not been living before. Many of us in isolation, some of us coming out of isolation, but cautiously so. Our world has been flipped and turned in very unusual ways. And so people are grappling with trying to make meaning of this moment. So since this is true, I'm wondering what are we in this moment considering and committing ourselves to co-creating with God right now? What kind of new world are we imagining right now? How will our ministry gifts and our ministries live down in the world? How will they aid others in living loving, fulfilled, thriving, and blessed lives? What I'm saying is I'm wondering if this moment is inviting us into a deeper sense of relationship, conversation, and commitment. What, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I, I think all moments kind of function that way, right? Like um, it is, it seems to me that it is important with any, it, with just kind of our, 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 our daily lives, but also particularly in crisis, that we begin to take stock of what, what 
what matters, what is true, what is most meaningful, what is, what, what is of greatest value. And those are questions that, uh, that probably should kind of stay at the forefront of our minds. Mm. But, you know, when you get caught up in the hustle and bustle of life, it's easy to lose sight of that. And so moments like this thing draw us back and draw us to and, and settle the mind. A friend of mine was t- uh, speaks about it. Like he, he says, you know, the chatter starts to quiet down. For me, the way, way, way I think of it is, you know, st- I, I, I get to be more still mm. inside myself. And, uh, and so, yes, I, I think exactly this moment is about uh, discerning those things. I think the one thing that we have to be mindful of, though, is the value of not settling them for, for oneself by oneself, but rather always being in conversation with others around. Because regardless of how broad our perspectives are, how well-meaning we are, how good of, of a person I am, I still only see the world from my point of view. And, and without the benefit of, of relationship with you, Cedric, and without the benefit of relationship with my, my own children and with my wife and, and with so many others uh, who, who, who I call dear, loved ones, I'm left to only, to constantly, I'm constantly only left to the best I can do rather than benefiting from the, from, from the benefit of, of having everyone else involved in my life. Yeah. That, that's very insightful. And um, Melvin, you and I are not the same. You're a very that's different right. person from me and I'm a very different person from you. We have some yeah. similarities, but we're not yeah. the same. Yeah. <clears throat> and yet we have found a way uh, in our differences, to to talk with one another honestly and forthrightly about those different perspectives, how my life is different from yours, and how it's similar, uh, what life is like for me, because you were curious, you asked, I didn't just up and mm-hmm. volunteer, you were curious about my life, you wanted to know what my life was like, and you consistently asked questions about that. And I'm sure sometimes I've said things that were surprising to you, because it was outside of your experience. (laughs) And you said some things that were surprising to me because they're outside of my experience. But I would say that I've been enriched by knowing you. And I hope that you've been enriched by knowing me. I won't assume that you have. Uh, But I hope that you have. Um, But you know it's true. You know it's true. For those who don't know, Cedric, can I interrupt you just a moment to tell, tell them the story of how we met? Sure. <laughs> so Cedric and I met at a conference. Um, well, I mean, it was just a little gathering. We're calling it a conference, right? It wasn't big, right? But it was a little gathering of folk who, who do kind of bridge building work. And, 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 uh, and I was kind of there as, as a guest, but most of the other folk were practitioners. And uh, we were given an assignment. And, and Cedric and I were sitting near each other. So we decided to, to, to couple up and, and, and go outside and do this assignment together. And I don't remember the particulars of the, of the assignment, Cedric, do you? Not exactly, but we were supposed to share some, some something and not so, yeah. Yeah, we were supposed to tell a story. We were supposed to share some kind of story with one another. Um, and it, it was, I, I can't imagine we ended up on the stories we ended up with without the, the assignment kind of saying, hey, make sure it's an it's, it's a intimate story or a, a, a meaningful story, something about like when you fell in love or something, right? Like something. Yeah. And uh, whatever it was, Cedric told me the story, a story of one of his, his, his falling in love moments. And, uh, and, and uh, when we went back inside, Apparently, the remainder, the, the balance of the assignment was not just that we were going to share with the whole group the story that we share uh, with one another, but we had to tell the story of our partner in the first person. So I had to become Cedric to tell his story. And when I tell you how deeply honored I was first off that he trusted me to be able to do that. And then, and, and then also how, how 
insightful is not, not a deep enough word. I, it, it was profound to be able to be in that moment as a heterosexual man, a cisgendered man, to, to, to be able to be in that moment and to, to express love. But love as a queer man towards another queer man uh, and, 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 and to let that live inside of me for a moment, right? I mean, it was, it was this kind of profound gift that perfectly embodied, you know, the, 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 the moment embodied what it is that you're talking about, Cedric, about being able to benefit from one another's difference. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was, it was a deeper level of walking in someone else's shoes because you're actually living inside someone else's story. Like nobody's business. I mean, I, 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 I encourage you if you've never done it, I wish I could give you a better setup. So, you know, the question that was asked, but if you've never done it, trying to relive someone else's experience in the first person and honoring that, that the, honoring the gift of the story that's been shared, it, 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 it'll change your life. It'll change your life. Yes. So for many of those that are on this call, <clears throat> uh, you may be practitioners, pastors, religious leaders, spiritual guides, and you may actually be in the midst of an exploration on how would I grapple or how shall I grapple with the challenges of creating a more welcoming space for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender queer people. <clears throat> And sometimes when you're doing that work, it can feel, feel rather isolating and you can feel rather alone. Uh, especially if you're in a setting where you're the one leading uh, and others are trying to keep up with where you're leading on issues of LGBTQ inclusion. And when you're feeling that kind of isolation or loneliness, <clears throat> one of the things that I've learned is it's really helpful to seek out others who are also in that process, to partner up with, to gain and build relationship with others who are in the work, uh, to find people that are asking similar questions, that are dreaming similar dreams, that are working towards the same kind of creative transformation that you're up to, people that are earnestly inquiring. They may not have it all worked out, but they're at least asking the questions. Um, by pairing up and having others, you do not feel like you have lost all sense of reality, which you may be hearing from some people who disagree with you, that you are out of your mind to even pursue this work. But when you have others around you who are also questioning and may not have it perfectly worked out, you realize that this is a journey of creating spaces that did not exist uh, before. So you're yeah. actually building something new in your setting, in your community, in your social location, or in your place of ministry or work. And so recognizing that others in other places around the country are doing the same can be most impactful and encouraging. Would you agree, Mayor Melvin? I would. I would, most definitely. Mm -hmm. Cedric, so, so to that end, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're looking at some of the chats that are coming through, right? Like, but um, um, one of them, uh, the, one of the most recent ones came through um, from Keisha and, and, and she was, uh, they were talking about the, um, the idea of the, the gift of congregational life um, where, where, you know, if, if you grew up kind of in, in church, there, 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 there are these beautiful, there, there, there's the time when kind of the word is given from on high, right? Like, and that's, you know, during the 11 o'clock hour for many and, and someone is standing at the pulpit and, 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 and telling people what it is they, they should understand. Um, but, but uh, one of the things that Keisha points out is how, how much richer are those moments when like during, Sabbath school or Sunday school or, or, or when you're just sitting around after church, after a good potluck, or after a good meal, and you get a chance to start 
start sharing one another's stories and asking questions and reflecting on on on, on the scriptures uh, the scripture for the day and so on and so forth as opposed to just kind of the didactic of of this is what you should think about this all the time yeah yeah it it, it uh the opportunity to actually uh, engage with one another and be in community with one another and sharing life experiences, lived experiences, uh, that is the place where we really get to understand how best to be in ministry with one another, how best to be in service with and among one another. Uh, yeah. Long ago, I realized that the word ministry is often presented as if it's this separate reality or vocation for this really, really segmented population of people. And mm -hmm. what I've come to realize is that ministry is the reality for us all as we are in service with and among one another. There are some yeah. people that have specific tasks that they perform as ministry, but all mm -hmm. of us have an opportunity to be of service with and among one another. I think that's also true about how we do theology, right? Like how, how it is we understand what it means to be people of, uh, people of God or people of the book or, you know, whatever language, you know, children of God, whatever language is, is true to, to, to the various traditions represented here on the phone, like this notion that somehow we understand the tradition as it's been handed down to us by, by reading it and, 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 and pondering it as opposed to by interacting with other people around it, I think is part of what gets us faulty. So back to some of these questions that are here in the side, right? Like one person, wrote, uh, uh, Adam wrote, you know, I, uh, I'm sure one of the people who wrote the Bible would have dropped some kind of nugget about the goodness of same sex relationships. Why does it always have to be a struggle to find truth? Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and, and here's the thing, right? Like, if we were willing to be in relationship with one another, to the depths that, that, that we should be, where we're actually hearing from folk who have different lived experiences, right? Like, so uh, e even around our sexual orientation, then we might start to see it because those stories are clearly there in the tradition. I'm, in this moment, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of this story where, um, where, where, where the, the, the uh, Israel has been captive. The, the Israelites have, have, have been captive in Babylon and they finally get a chance to, to come home again after about 70 years uh, 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 living in Babylon. And when they get back, uh, folk are trying to figure out, you know, like how do we, their leaders are trying to figure out how do we avoid ever having that happen to us ever again? Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that that story, the, one, one of the ways that, that one of those lead, that the, the, the leaders, the two leaders who kind of find, uh, take prominence in that story are Ezra, who was a priest and Nehemiah, who was kind of the governor. And, 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 and what, what ends up happening, they are so committed to kind of this purity culture that they end up doing some crazy things in the name of God. One of them, one of them I think it's Ezra, tells this story of, of, of grabbing, going into the temple and seeing someone who was of mixed heritage, right? Like, so think black and white. And grabbing that person by their hair and snatching them out of the temple, dragging them out of the temple, right? Because, because they were Jewish and mixed with, with uh, some of the people who, who lived in the area. Because when, when the Israelites were taking off to Babylon, it was mainly the, the uh, aristocracy. But a lot of the poor folk got left back in Jerusalem. And so people made a life together. They started mixing and mingling and people married. And so some of the children that were born were of mixed heritage. He drags this joker out of the temple. He drags this young man out of the temple. And then he prays in, in, in his book. He prays. He says, God, remember me for doing this good thing. 
in your name. Well, one of the things that, that ends up happening is the school of the prophets, this, this school of the prophets who stand in the tradition of the, of, of the, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah has been long dead, but these are people who, who've kept that tradition alive. They start to speak up and they start to talk about, they, they write this, this epic poetry, right? In, in third Isaiah, um, uh, Isaiah is actually a book that's broken into three parts, right? Like, and so on the, in the third part of this thing, they write this epic poem about all the people that God is going to give a place in, 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 in the temple when God gets a chance to set things right. And, and that includes people of mixed heritage. And it also very clearly includes the sexual other. At that moment, it was, it was people who were referred to as eunuchs. But, they, but clearly, clearly, they are, uh, uh, the sexual other is, is, is central to that story. We just don't tell it that way. And we don't tell it that way because some of us don't have eyes to see it. We don't have ears to hear it. But when, when, when what I've found is that when stories come down to us, and they resonate as particularly true because they're part of our own lived experience, then we tend to develop eyes to see ourselves in those stories. So Adam, they're there. They're there. The stories are there. We just have to be courageous enough to begin to re reimagine them because the, the most strident voices among us have sometimes written us out of the story. Yes, and so bringing up that point, Melvin, it's interesting that again, it causes us to reflect on what lenses are we bringing to our reading of sacred text? What are we seeing, but what are we missing in the richness of the stories and in the richness of the, of the text? The other challenge of course is, um, so for example, when you think about the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch in, uh, in uh, Christian scripture, uh, the New Testament writing, uh, is one of the first to receive that message and to seek baptism that was outside of the Jewish tradition was a Gentile, but not only was a Gentile, was a eunuch, but not only was a eunuch, but was of African descent. Uh, one might say that the Ethiopian eunuch is the embodiment in scripture of intersectionality. Come on uh, now. Uh, right there in word? the text. Uh, and so, <laughs> so we have, there's a richness that can be mined from the text if we are willing to bring our lenses, fresh lenses to the reading of the text and recognize also that we in our own lives are written epistles, that we are living texts in this moment, at this time, we are writing new scripture each day that we live because yes. people read us more than they read the book. That's right. They That's read right. us more than they read the book. The other challenge, of course, is there's the institution uh, of religion, churches and denominations and jurisdictions and, and conventions. There are institutions. And those institutions also impinge upon our ability to live out our faith. So the challenge often is I, as an individual, we have a heart that's being led by the Holy Spirit and by God to go in a certain direction but I'm affiliated with an institution that is not willing to go that way at all. I'm affiliated with a denomination that is not willing to go that way at all. And so I'm left with the struggle between the calling of my heart and the dictates, doctrines, and teachings of the denomination or institution with whom I'm affiliated. In those moments, I want to share that it is useful, not unlike uh, the gathering of the prophets in responding to Ezra, it is useful to consider when looking at faith institutions, the standards of grace, the standards of life-giving, life-sustaining ministry and work, the standards of faith as opposed to fear and judgment, the standards of love and welcome over condemnation and division. And so when you see the institution leaning towards those condemnation, div divisive, uh, fearful, uh, not life-giving and li life-sustaining, uh, not filled with grace kinds of actions, 
uh, that's a moment of deep moral, ethical, prayerful reflection for you as an individual. Yeah, yeah, I, I, reflection and resistance, right? Like, like this, uh, this idea that uh, we must give ourselves to, to, to what we find to be death dealing has got to die. You know, uh, Joshua said, I put before you life or death, choose life. Jesus says, I come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly, right? So even if, so even if uh, someone comes along and says, well, you know, the, the tradition teaches that, that if, 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 you, if you aren't of a particular orientation, if you don't live your life in a particular way, you're going to be lost, you're going to hell. These death dealing theologies do not stack up against the author of, of, of the faith, right? Because the author of the faith, faith said, God's house shall be a house for all people, right? And so, so, so we need to, to, to your point about these lenses, right? Even when those lenses are institutionally enforced, we have to be courageous enough and be willing to live in the resistance of putting on our life-giving, our life-affirming lenses and saying, nope, I'm going to follow the one who is the, who, who, who is the author of life, making, creating welcome and embrace for all, affirmation for all, as opposed to living towards this notion of, of, of exclusion and invalidation and, and, and dismissal of, of, of some. So, Crystal, I'm wanting to know where are we on time? Well, we I don't I don't want to take everyone's time away from them. We have just about ten minutes left, okay. um, and I really enjoy the way both of you speak so freely about and passionately about this this topic. It gets me fired up. I don't know about everyone else, um, but we do have. Uh, I want to take one or two questions, one or two more questions before we. Uh, go towards the homework and uh, talking about the, the chat um, area. But um, Miles asks, have any of you found constructive ways to engage people of faith who suggest that anyone who has a different interpretation than them is just bending the text to make it say what they want it to say? Melvin, do you want to start and I'll follow up? Would you, would you ask that question one more again? I got distracted by the, the chat. <laughs> no worries. Have any of you found constructive ways to engage with people who, uh, oh, it keeps moving. There we go. I found Constructive it. ways. That's the key right there. Constructive. Yeah. To engage. I, I do have a way. <laughs> <laughs> it's gotta be helpful. It might not always be constructive, but I do have ways. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just to, for people who are constantly saying that if your opinion is different from theirs, then you are bending the text. Is there a way to, to have, um, to navigate this difficult conversation with them? So, mm, one of the, one of the, the, the things that, that I've learned to do is to root things in the store in people's story, right? Like so, I I I try to stay nowadays. I you know I I do love a good debate, but I try to stay away from kind of the debate of doctrine, right? Um, I try to 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 focus on what's the story that brings us together. What's the what? what how has the story been handed down to us? And because I can, I, I, because I have facility with, with rooting things in people's sacred tradition, in the stories that matter to them, that hit them at the heart level and not just at the head level, then, then it's a lot easier then to point out, to, to show, to demonstrate, to hear the thing that's different than kind of our doctrinal position when it's sitting right there in our sacred narrative, as opposed to me just trying to reason someone to it, right? And so that's one of the, one of the things that, that, that I've learned to do 
is to really, really kind of delve back into the tradition in that way so that the tradition starts to speak to me in all the ways, uh, in ways separate and apart from the kind of doctrinal interpretation that was handed down to me over time. So yeah, thank you for that, Melvin. Thank you. Um, bending the text to make it say what you want it to say. Well, let's, let's think about that. So uh, I'm imagining that this individual that is making this claim uh, is finding that what you're saying doesn't match with what they have been taught or what they have been led to understand or what they have been led to believe. And it's interesting always to me when people kind of get their hackles up <laughs> to kind of pause and say, so what do you think the text says? Why do you think it says that? What has informed your opinion about the text in this way? And then share, well, here's how I've come to what I understand the text to be saying. I'm not trying to bend it, I'm just saying, you came to a particular understanding based on whatever you based it upon, and here's how I have arrived. But laying that aside, how are we representing the God of our understanding, the God of grace and love and mercy and justice and peace? How are we doing with that as opposed to debating different readings of the text? How are we positively impacting people's lives? Like, what are we really up to? Is it about being, being so focused on bibliolatry, worship of the book, that we lose sight that the book is designed and intended through the Holy Spirit to lead us into better relationship with and among one another? So if the book is getting in the way of us loving one another, for this moment, can we focus on that? Can we focus on how we're actually enriching and helping and ministering to the betterment of people's lives? Because our readings of this text have changed over the thousands plus years since we've had the text. And As a lot a of people fact, don't know that. Said <laughs> a lot yeah. of people. A lot of people don't really think that the way they read the text now and the way they tell the story now <laughs> is the way it's always been told. No. Oh no, no, no. And we and we know this. And so calling people back to that awareness. Because there was a time when we, there was a time when divorce, divorce, not LGBTQ issues, divorce was the pinpoint. That oh, yeah. is what everyone was focused on. Yeah. yeah. There was a time when race, slavery was the big debate that we were focusing on. We have had multiple of debates on multiple topics where that was the preeminent topic. So we read scripture differently over time and we, continue, we will continue to do so. And so it's not about bending the text at all. And then it's not just only about the text. Right. Thank yeah. you both. I think that was a very thorough answer. And um, I wish that I had time to read aloud all of the comments because uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting um, discussion over there. Um, but we only set aside an hour and I want to hold to that. Um, something that we have set up for, for those of you who want to continue to uh, have this conversation. I mean, because really we just dipped a toe in, didn't we? Um, you yeah. know, yeah. 30 to 45 minutes just isn't enough to talk about <laughs> how to treat uh, ourselves and other people when we're about to have these conversations. Um, and so we've set up a, a chat room in our Bible app that's just for this cohort where um, we will hopefully abide by some really simple, respectful chat, chat rules and be able to ask these hard questions uh, without fear of uh, somebody jumping down your throat. We want you know, to, to be able to ask the, uh, the semi-inappropriate, the hard, the tangled, the, the thing that, that you are terrified of asking because you don't know the lingo of the queer community. We've set that up. And so the easiest way to, to sign up for that is um, uh, I'll be sending out an email after this. We've recorded today's discussion. We'll send that to you along with the link uh, to sign up. But just so you know that every Thursday, 
um, at around 4 p.m. We'll have uh, two people in the, in the chat room to help you kind of uh, to kick around those questions. Um, myself and you know, one, other, one other host who uh, is gonna help you kind of you know, work your way through those questions. And um, until then, to keep the conversation going, I've asked uh, Melvin and Cedric to provide you with some homework. And I saw somebody say homework. I mean, it's gonna be, I mean, it's elective. But um, <laughs> just to take away from the conversation and a way to move forward, um, as you have you know, volunteered to do this, we want to do our best uh, to give you everything we have. So um, I'll ask Melvin and, and, and Cedric to close out with their, with their homework. Melvin, you want to go first? I have a second one. Oh, well, you go first, okay. and uh, we'll see if mine gets necessary. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, at this, at this moment in time and, and with all this going on, um, I have found that both music and poetry have kept me going. And so this is an invitation. Of course, you can always accept the invitation or decline the invitation, as, as Crystal has said around the homework. One invitation I want to extend is um, from sacred scripture, from the Bible, I wanted to turn to Psalm 24. And I wanted to invite the reading of Psalm 24 uh, during this time in different versions, not just the King, Dame, King James Version. So kind of read Psalm 24 in various versions, pick two or three versions and read it and see how it might be speaking both in this exact moment around COVID-19, but also in terms of LGBTQ inclusion and affirmation to you. Um, that's kind of my, my invitation. Yeah. Cool. Um, I want to, so I, I, I do work around kind of the, the, the telling of the biblical narrative and, um, have been for a while, ever since I became a dad, um, trying to trying to find uh, life giving ways um, to to share the, the the tradition with my kids, and um, and so started a, a a story collection project uh, years and years ago, that every once in a while I go back and add to again, um, but but uh, I was. I shared earlier the t that, that telling of the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. And I would like to invite you, if you so desire, I'm going to throw it here into our chat and hopefully it'll go to everyone that's here. But it's, 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 a, it's a reimagining of the, uh, of the story of Ezra and Nehemiah in one or two parts there. And I want to invite you to, 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 to delve into it. And if you're, if, if you're straight and you're on the phone call, I want you to begin to see the ways in which our, 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 our inclinement towards purity, what we call purity culture, but which is actually just exclusion culture, which is a death dealing uh, project, how that has created the kind of harm it's created in the lives of others sometimes unwittingly, sometimes when we didn't know it. And, and, and if, if you happen to be LGBTQIA on, the call, on the, the call, I want to invite you to read it and be affirmed in who you are and your place in the conversation, not just in, in society and community, but in the conversation around faith and, 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 under, and be, be affirmed how much the conversation of faith and faith communities need uh, those who are queer to be a part of them mm. so that we can begin to see the world. You can, we can queer the world, queer our theology and begin to see the world in more, in more beautiful and life-giving ways. Now you're just scaring people, Melvin. <laughs> <laughs> queer the world, my goodness. <laughs> Um, I have a fantastic note taker here who uh, has been writing down the homework and we'll send that to you tomorrow. I've also included the link if you wanted to sign up uh, to be part of the in-app chat um, on Thursdays moving forward. And 
Um, in three weeks, we have our next panelist who will be talking about sex and sexuality. And I really hope that you'll attend. And like I said, uh, this is recorded and we'll send it to you. Um, I'll also include, if that's okay, Cedric and Melvin, just uh, simple contact information for you both if they have questions. Yes, um, feel free. You both feel free, reach so, out. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> it's a really thank good you. time together. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye, folks. <laughs>